Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey It's your take On today's Your Take, I talk to a British Impressionist. My guest is a veteran of show business for over 25 years, having worked in voiceover, radio, television and stage. My guest rose to national attention in 2010 when he became the finalist on Britain's Got Talent. This led to a debut television show that was watched by over 3 million people, a feature film debut in the Harry Hill movie, touring the country with comedian Joe Pasquale and appearing in various pantomimes. Fellow Bristol resident, impressionist, stand-up, all-round entertainer and father of three, Paul Berlin joins us this morning. A very warm welcome and thank you kindly for joining us for your take. Lovely to see you uh, this morning. Yes, good morning, James. Good morning, everyone. Yes, it's been it's, it's an honour to be on here, mate. It's really thank you so much for asking me, really. Well, yeah, just because I waffle on, you'll put together as the interview goes on, mate. <laughs> we've only been running for such a short time, uh, six months. And we've we've interviewed various people in the the kind of music industry, from songwriters to performers. We've interviewed a, a glamour model, two comedians, but you're the first impressionist we've had on so I'm interested to find out about your career what you do and just find out more about kind of your your occupation but yeah, why <laughs> <laughs> why indeed yeah because 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 I find it interesting yeah um <laughs> we'll go back to the very beginning we'll wind the clock back to 1969 um yeah. Yeah, so you, you were born in Hertfordshire. Yeah. I, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about what your childhood was like and just about kind of your relationship with your parents and your, your three sisters. Yeah, um, well, yeah, I was sort of born in Hitchin Hurts, as they always say, Hitchin Hurts, and um, then they moved. And I was actually born at home, I wasn't born in hospital, and my dad helped me being born, apparently. I don't remember, obviously. And um, yeah, and we lived with sort of council house folk back then, you know, and uh, yeah, we just, we just sort of uh, all got on with it and we went, did the right, tried to do the right things. And parents always been fine, and my dad always used to tell me off for doing voices, strangely enough, when I was a kid. Um, the reason I did that was to probably try and get attention between my three sisters at the time, you know? So it's just like <laughs> survival of the fittest. And then I thought, you know, because I was quite, believe it or not, James, I was very shy. I, I am still quite shy now, actually. But I was very, very shy. So um, I sort of just used to, if, you know, girls are girls and, you know, I just argue. My, I just found this word sort of din in the house where they're arguing, as girls do. Um, and folks do as well, but girls, you know, sisters do, you know, in, in, in your subliminal mind you know they just think you're the only just do his argument talk about hair and nails and stuff and barbie dolls and stuff and um but yeah so i just sort of used to take myself off into my own little world and um but i used to just watch cartoons and that's how it all sort of started for movie impressions really because i just love i still to this day love animation you know and um and i'd just be sitting there watching the um warner brother cartoons so sort yeah. of you yeah. elmer fudds bugs bunnies the um Foghorn Leghorn, which is always a sort of a, okay, son, okay, I'm a chicken, and all that, you know. And, and I used to sit there going and sort of copying them and thought oh, I was quite fun. And as I grew up, I realised it was just one person did all those voices. It was Mel Blanc. He did all the voices for the Warner Brothers, every single voice. I thought, wow, this one person does all those voices. And it sort of inspired me, maybe subliminally, because I was so shy, I never envisaged until quite late on that I could make a career out of doing voices, you know, and being in the entertainment of the show. And uh, I just found, yeah, and I just, just, so as I went on and um, I said, my dad used to tell me off, he used to tell me off for doing voices, you know, speak speak properly, you know, and all right, dad, that sort of thing. Um, but I sort of went to school, obviously, I obviously went to school, and, um, but I used to sort of do voices to make friends. Do you know what I mean? because <laughs> I was so shy James and uh, that's what happens and doing the cartoons going oh you're good or do Bugs Bunny or 
that'll be you know going again we were we were very quiet and all that you know yeah we should talk and all that sort of stuff and all that sort of thing really and and that sort of progressed from there and because i thought well you know because people get i'm getting a bit of attention as one mm-hmm. does as you're growing up and they uh and that's how i sort of made friends and um stopped you know, I wasn't bullied that much, but, you know, the school buddy used to think I was funny because I used to go, oh, no, do a voice who didn't hit me or something, you know. And and that sort of progressed through um, my adolescence and that, that sort of, when I moved up to sort of that secondary school, um, I got to know another set of friends because of the, doing the voices and stuff. And then it got to a point where, again, I wouldn't do it on as a, you know, it was more like a party piece as, a, as opposed to, this is what I'm going to do, totally do an impressionist life for me sort of thing. They used to give me a challenge and I had to be someone or characters from a particular TV programme for the day, the next day. It's interesting you kind of paint this portrait and I share the sentiment, those, these excellent Warner Brothers cartoons, mm. they're, just, they're classics and they're so wonderfully voiced and, and done. You mentioned about the the self confidence issues, and you know it's a way of kind of coming out of your shell. But at what moment did you kind of think, how do I go from having this kind of hobby, this skill that I'm very good at, and then thinking, well, actually, maybe I could make a career. I could actually, you know, earn a living from doing these voices, these impressions. When did that kind of hit home for you? Um. Well, as I sort of turned in, when I left school, I, I was a bit lost, if I'm honest. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I did various jobs. First of all, I worked on a pig farm. Um, that was fun. Uh, and because I'm from Hertfordshire, where I'm from, we lived in a village. A very, very small, it, was even a, it wasn't even a village. It was a hamlet. It didn't even have a pub or even a shop. So you had to go to the next village to go, to go to the shop anyway. Um, so I got a job. My mum got me a job on this when I left school on a, on a on a pig farm and um yeah that was i didn't enjoy that too much just because of hard work really and then i sort of flitted around doing various jobs yeah and but at the same time i was still doing voices to people so they become my friends do you know what i mean in new environment and if i felt confident enough with these people i would start going you know hey, how you doing you know all that sort of stuff and silly voices and oh that's quite funny isn't it you know and then um they all sounded like that of course back in the oh, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? and <laughs> they all sounded like that back in the in the 80s and um yeah and how the transition happened really is that I sort of decided to move uh away from home and some one of my jobs which I really did enjoy I used to work for a, a roadside cafe I don't know if I can really mention brands. Can I mention brands? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, go ahead. So anyway, I was I was the little chef at the little chef, and I loved it. I really, really loved it because I do like cooking. And I okay, it's not saying necessarily cooking, but it's grill cooking and all that sort of stuff. But I really, really enjoyed it because I had that experience. I went down to job centre and said, "Look, I want to get a job." Blah, 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 blah. And I worked. Uh, I got a job out on in Great Yard near Great Yarmouth, a place called Hemsby, and working on a holiday park which is a Pontins then, called Seacroft, and I was what they called a KP. That's a kitchen porter. So basically, I t- I've, I've never been a morning person, never will be, but I had to get up at like six o'clock in the morning uh, <laughs> and start getting breakfast ready for with all the other staff. And again, I didn't know anybody, so I just started mucking about. I just started mucking about. So people would speak to me. It sounds sad, doesn't it, mate? You know, um, and I just used to do impressions, and then people go, "Oh, that's funny." And then in the cans, because then it was so. This is nineteen eighty-eight. Ah, oh, blimey, long time ago. And um, people started coming to the canteen when we finished work and going to the staff room and say, "Hey, Berlin, do a doing like Julian Clare, doing impression of Julian Clare. Hey, Panthers, you know, sticky moment and all that sort of stuff. Just kind of point out this is quite early, so my voice hasn't warmed up yet. <laughs> but I don't hold this against me, mate. No, it's very good. <laughs> so, you know, hey, and all that sort of stuff. And the entertainment manager there heard about this KP that did impressions. That was pretty good at impressions. So one day he grabbed, got hold of me and took me into his office and said, look, I hear you do a few impressions. And I went, yeah, you know. Because I didn't really think much of it, and I never say, even then envisaged it as a career. I was fairly happy where I was in the kitchens and stuff like that. 
well, unhappy, but you know, it was a job. And um, then he said, I'll write a list of impressions that you do. So this is 1988. So I wrote a list of about 60 different voices that I did at the time. Um, some stuff is like stuff you'd never use now. You know, I was doing things like um, Windsor Davis from Ain't Half Hot Mum and all that. You're far too young to remember that, of course, James. Uh, <laughs> Love you, boy. And all that. Oh, can I sing my song? And all that sort of stuff. And Frank Spencer, obviously, everyone did a bit of Frank, you know. <laughs> and uh, Norman Wisdom and just did a bit of Norman and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, Billy Connolly, of course. Billy, bit better, because he's all right to do it this time of day, because it's fab and groovy. And so that's what I sort of did, really. And he goes, "Wow, you do all these impressions." I went, "Oh yeah, yeah." Like that, you know, not ever thinking or envisaging they were going to actually get me up on stage. Two nights later, <laughs> I'm at the bar in this particular room, and the entrance manager said, "Paul, can you just do me five minutes, mate? Because the the, cab the cabaret's running late." No, I can't do that. And Mark, who I met as a fellow kitchen porter then, who's still my best friend today. Big lad, really big, tall, you know, lad. And he threatened to punch me if I didn't do it. So violence sometimes works, but not always, folks. Just remember that. <laughs> and um, he threatened me, which is true. <laughs> he threatened me. And I don't even remember what I did, but I went, all I remember, the only thing I remember is I had this, you know, with the really awful, elasticated beards. <laughs> And I put that on and I just walked over. Oh, hello, everybody. It's Fab and Groove or whatever. And I don't even remember what I did. But back then I was just getting people. So then I got a bit confident, you know, and I was going, because I had sort of a thing in my head that if I just say to people, anybody remember Rainbow? Or you know, back in the 80s, was, Rainbow was still around. You remember Rainbow, I'm sure. Most yeah, I remember it fondly, yeah. You know, very fondly. And, um, I go, anybody remember Rainbow? And there was no gags to it. It's a bit like my act still now. And um, so I was like, oh, oh yes, I think Bungle's going out. I'll put some more petrol on him, George. Oh, 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 oh. And they just got a big woof. And because I was a KP, I was a kitchen boy. That's how I was introduced. And that was it. That was the moment. I thought, wow. So that, that was kind of for you. That was kind of the. The big break, the lucky break, I guess. Absolutely. Right time, yeah, right. That moment. That's what this business is about. Sometimes it's been in the right place at the right time. And it was just like, it's not when like, this is it. This is what I want to do. I just want to make put a smile on people's faces. And I've got all these voices. And why can't I just do that rather than being stuck in the kitchen? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so that's how it started. That was the turning point. And then I went on to be like a blue coat, red coat. And that's how I got away my apprenticeship. I wanted to ask you about the, the impersonating because, you know, some names ring, come to mind, like Roy Bremer. Bremer yeah. was obviously an excellent impressionist Brilliant. who had his own Channel 4 show. But I think as kind of the audience, when we view that, we solely kind of think about the performer just Im imitating the actual voice, getting the voice right. But the thing I was going to ask you is when you do an impersonation of someone or mimic their kind of voice do you need to kind of mimic their kind of body language and their mannerisms as well is that kind of a key thing as well as just solely the solely the voice absolutely um i was speaking to a mate of mine i haven't seen for a while the other day and he was saying when you do voices your face seems to just sort of contort and it's not because i've physically gone in front of a mirror and gone mm, 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 whatever <laughs> it's just because People say, when do you get a voice? You know, when you get a new voice, how do you... And that sounds really weird, and the, the viewers don't think I'm weird. But if it's a new voice, and sometimes, to refresh it sometimes, I envisage in my mind's eye that character. Do you know what I mean? Whether it's a cartoon character or a real person or you know, a puppet or whatever, I envisage that character in my head, in my mind's eye. And then for some reason, my voice, my face seems to contort to that, you know, because when you do not do boy, you've got to do all that in you, not me, <laughs> you know. I got it. Yeah. yeah think... the, the reason I kind of ask that question is if I kind of take a, a personality and I'll pick my favourite actor of all time, Robert De Niro. Yeah. One of the key things about him, he's a method actor. Yeah. And everything's done in the, the face or the, yeah, absolutely. You know, the the frowning, the mannerisms. It's kind of, yeah, that's kind of, <laughs> that's, that's, that's Robert De Niro for you. Exactly. Yeah. 
it's similar. Oh, I don't know if it's similar really, because you know, but I just yeah, I envisage that character. Do you know what I mean? And sort of um, in my head, I am that character. And that even sounds really weird, even if it's a cartoon, whatever you know. But once you've got once you've got it, it, it sort of stays. You don't have to keep practicing it as such. There were times when I first started out. Somebody, another, maybe another impression or a comic or whatever I met down the years, you know, said to me, you know, got to practice in front of the mirror, you know, and got to, you know, and I probably did it for a little while. Um, but since then, I sort of, that's why I have a wife that tells me, you know, she tells me if I'm rubbish or not. <laughs> She's worse than Simon Cowell. Anyway. <laughs> your best critic, your most honest critic. It's interesting. Absolutely. So far, you've painted this portrait of your early childhood years, your fascination with animation, confidence issues, mm. then the, the lucky break, becoming um, an entertainer at a sort of holiday park and going from there. I kind of want to ask you, your kind of massive break was obviously going back to 2010 with the Britain's Got Talent auditions and then becoming a finalist. Before we come on to that, I want to ask you, what made you decide to apply for the show? And just a bit about the, the process of going into the kind of televised um, broadcast. What, how does it kind of work, the application, the auditions? What was the whole process like for you? Okay, well, it, not a lot of people know this, but uh, well, it's, it's, it's not quite well known. I auditioned the very first series when Paul Potts won it. And um, went over to Cardiff, and uh, just applied like everybody else. Do you know what I mean? We, I just sort of applied for it and had pre you have pre-auditions as well. So you don't, what you audition season, your first audition, I think on X Factor, now defunct X Factor, there's a few million Simon's not going to use, um, or have, um, they had quite a few uh, pre-auditions. I think if Britain's Got Talent, it's normally just the one. So you go over, like, I, I think, Anyway, I can't remember exactly what happened, but I just applied for it, got an pre-audition, then I got picked to go through to do the actual audition. This is the first time round, and we've, I've been doing it for a long time, even then, you know, so this is, I don't know, 2000, I can't remember now, seven, was it? 2007? 2007, maybe? I think it's 2008, I think it was. Anyway, and... Um, so I've been going around for a long time. You know, I've been still been quite an established act and, you know, an entertainer and all that sort of stuff. And I just wanted to sort of raise my profile, really. Like, that's what you do. You know, it's the biggest showcase in the world, you know, for someone like myself. And I went on there and I was a bit like, hi, I'm Paul Burling, yeah. So what do you do? Oh, I'll do impressions. Okay, off you go. And... Um, it wasn't the routine that we saw, because they never showed it, but it wasn't the routine that we saw, and then I did it four years later, um, or 2010, rather. And he, Piers actually, because it was Piers and Amanda and Simon, Piers actually buzzed me. You know, and it's like, oh, okay. And anyway, I got, I got through, but I didn't get through, obviously, any further, because they obviously didn't show it, da 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 da, da. And it sort of affected me a little bit. And it's, I don't want people thinking I'm being pretentious or anything like that. It's just because um, I didn't quite get it in the fact that, you know, they're making a TV programme. You're going to have people that go through who aren't necessarily as talented as myself or anybody else. It's just they're making a variety show and some of them aren't as good. And, you're still, and But from my point of view, at that time, I was like, well, what, I've been doing this for... Not that I expected to win or anything at all like that. Again, I don't want the viewers to think I'm being pretentious. It was like, you know, there's people I've got through who aren't great, you know, and why am I not in that in that semi-final and final or whatever, mm -hmm. or even in the semi-final? Mm -hmm. This sort of affected me a little bit. And I come back to my now wife, and because she wasn't my wife then, um, we um she said, Don't do it, don't do it, just don't put yourself through it. And then so this is then now 2010, right? So it's 2009, obviously, because we do the original early auditions in like in the November. And Leah didn't, my wife didn't know because what happened was I was doing a gig down in Lou in Cornwall. I holiday park down there. My mate 
uh, was there. And obviously, I had a great night and I was staying over and all this sort of stuff and was having a couple of beers after the show. I smashed I got a great gig, you know, real nice buzzing gig. And um, my mate, uh, Bubba, his name's Bubba, and uh, he was on his laptop and was having a couple of beers, having a laugh and all this sort of stuff. And he turns around the laptop and it was the application form for Britain's Got Talent again. I said, no, I'm not doing that. Been there, done that. You know, I mean, I'm not going to put myself through that sort of thing. Anyway, about two or three pints later. <laughs> oh, yeah, all right then. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, we'll do that. And that was it. That, you know, that was it. And then, of course, the second time, I auditioned, had to audition again, pre-audition. So some people are sourced um, by researchers. It's well known uh, that they go through various YouTubes and find people they would like on the show and apply, you know, I wasn't one of them. I applied again, like I said, on that drunken night in Lou. And um and then we um so did the audition in a hotel in Cardiff, pre-audition. And then it was com- it sort of was completely different to my first experience. Because I think they really like, second time they earmarked me, I think, if that's the right phrase yeah. and they were constantly ringing me we wasn't i did pantomime i was doing pantomime and they were ringing me then i was doing we went on holiday with me and leah went on holiday we was out in egypt phone never stopped ringing from researchers going you've got any old pictures we in bloody egypt you know what i mean what are you doing do you know what i mean what? just leave me alone so I, I, there's a completely different feel um i had a selected time i came in from my actual audition in which everyone saw and yeah and completely different and obviously to my advantage, which is great. And um, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was obviously a great experience because it went really, really, really well. We've got somebody in the van going, beep, 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 this vehicle is reversing, this vehicle is reversing. So I wanted to, to go back to the, the first time you appeared on the, the programme on Britain's Got Talent, the first broadcast appearance. What was it like kind of walking on that stage and in front of that audience and obviously the, the reaction from the, the panellists as well, the, the judges? Tell us a little bit about that, ex- that overall experience. Yeah, it, like I said before, when I was, um, I did it the first time round, it was a different experience because the second time I went out of sort of like being the cheeky chappy while we go, Hello, yes, I'm Paul Burning and I do impressions. And I was like, hi, yeah, you know, a bit more show busy, darling. You know, and it was um, yeah, I it was, it was I felt that I sort of thought, well, after my first experience, I thought, let's just go for it. Well, I've got nothing to lose. Do you know what I mean? What's the worst that can happen? You know, get booed off or whatever. And um, nobody will know. <laughs> and so anyway, yes, yeah, so when I went out there, I was like being really cheeky chappy and and I had a lot more banter that you saw. That was it was because obviously edited and stuff. But I had a lot more banter uh, with the judges than uh, than uh, what you actually saw. And there's a bit where Simon says, "So what's your worst gig?" And I said, "And I said about getting paid off." And he goes, um, "What you don't actually see." And he goes, "What do you mean paid off? It's when it's when you get paid off and you like I do 15 minutes and they tap you on the shoulder, and say, get off, mate, and here's your money. So you get paid off. That's the, that's what happened." Only once in my career, I hastened to add. <laughs> and, um, and it wasn't very nice. It's many, many, many years ago. And, um, but what you didn't see was Simon said, well, let's hope you don't get paid off tonight, Paul. And I went, well, you can pay me off if you like. Maybe it's going to cost you hundred grand. So, you know what I mean? So it's like, and I had that sort of banter. Piers was going, Who's, do you, who does this, you know, uh, impressionist-wise, who do you aspire to? And I was sort of like, oh, yeah, Mike Yarwood, because I'm old enough to remember him. And I think you'll see it on the video on the on YouTube and you know Bobby Davro, etc., and Alistair McGowan and John Coleshaw and stuff nowadays. And then he goes, What about Les Dennis, who used to be married to Amanda, of course? <laughs> yeah. Well, and I went, I don't really know. For those of you who don't know that Les Dennis was an impressionist with Dustin G, he was very good. And his thing was Mavis from Coronation Street, which is many moons ago. Younger people are going to go, I don't know what you're on about. But anyway, and of course, Amanda was married to Les and that's, it was a laugh and everybody laughed. And that, but even before I'd now, I've now sort of settled into this sort of cheeky chappy routine before I did my routine and the audience seemed to sort of warm to me straight quite quickly because I was giving it a bit of banter. Where like I say the first time I was like, yeah, just do impressions. And- you know, maybe that's sort of the, the shy side of me that gone 
that the first time round. And um, yeah, and then the actual reaction, this genuine reaction to get 3,000 people stood up was a genuine reaction. Um, doing the cartoons, because sort of Harry Hill, obviously, and, and then started doing the cartoon medley, which I wrote for Panto. And I thought, um, it always got a good reception when I did it in Panto or in my act, you know. Um, but to get that, I think halfway through, I, it clicks and the audience are going crazy for it. And I think people see that. And that was genuine. That was a genuine reaction because I didn't expect it, to be honest, mate. I was like, well, what, what are you doing? And um, yeah, and to get the stunning ovation and the comments that I got, you know, peers from buzzing me the first time says I'm the best impressionist they've ever had on Britain's Got Talent, you know, back then, which is very kind. Um, it's very true, but uh, very kind. And um, yeah, and Amanda loved you me and the fact that I, you know, my background was a sort of normal background and yeah. And so there, yes, it was very nice. You know, you can always tell Simon likes you because apparently he's a big cartoon fan as well. I believe he loves all the Hanna Barberas and you know, and he's been on. He's voiced on things like Family Guy and Simpsons and stuff, hasn't he? So it was appeared, if you like, <laughs> on, you know. And so he's a big animation fan as well. So that sort of worked for me as well, I believe. So yeah, it was it was a great experience. So sadly, my wife wasn't there because we'd just come back off holiday and she had to go to work. I was on my own. It's like, no, that was just me on my own. But anyway. Well, obviously for you, the whole experience was a, a game changer. And like you said, a, a great, you know, experience. And it obviously um, has spawned a, a great career for you. But the thing I was going to ask is obviously week by week, you're progressing from round one to the quarters to the semi-final. And then all of a sudden you're in the final of Britain's Got Talent. What was it like, the experience of the final? And I was going to also ask you, were you kind of disappointed in any way that you didn't win the show or that kind of competitive nature? Or you, were you just glad of the, the moment, the experience and what came after that? Um, well, because in the final, if people remember, and again, watch on YouTube, I did the 500 Miles, which is like a medley of impressions within the 500 Miles song. And you do get to rehearse it a couple of times in the daytime before the actual final. And I couldn't get it right because it was just sort of a new thing, you know, and um, I couldn't get it right. I kept messing it up. And Anna Decker there, so I'm name dropping now, anyway, who are lovely, by the way, who are really lovely. And Deck was like really nice. And he's like, a, well, I mean, how do you do all those voices, mate? Oh, great. And, I, and um, I said, oh, it's talent, darling, you know, and he was like, I'm laughing at me. But I couldn't get it right. I couldn't nail the, the whole song for some reason. So come the actual live final, I think we had 14 million viewers for that particular year final. Wow. And because I, in my head, I thought if I mess this up, that undoes everything that I've achieved on the, that particular program, and probably my career. You're the one that messed it up in the final way. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I was, I've never been so nervous. I mean, I'm always nervous before I do any gig, regardless of what it is, whether it's TV or, or anything. I'm always nervous, which I think is a good thing. I like to think. Um, but I found that was the most, I've, I've never, I've, I was literally cacking myself because it, it then hit me. It actually hit me that, well, there's a lot of people watching this. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I can, I can imagine, and a lot of expectation on your shoulders that, and oh, pressure. Just, I don't look into things that I didn't at the time I didn't look into it that much, but again, Mark was there and my wife, now wife Leah, and, and that were like looking at the odds. And I was sort of joint favourite to win the whole thing at the time, which luckily he didn't tell me. Oh no, he did actually. He said, Oh, you're a joint favourite, by the way, mate. <laughs> like, he's <been> like, <laughs> and <laughs> oh, okay, no pressure. And it is that pressure of like not being remembered for the guy that messed it up. Because in the semi-final, I did. If you remember, I did forget my where I was at one point. And uh, that was pointed out a couple of times, but being the old pro that I am, I got out of it. And, um, but yeah, it was quite hard. Um, hard, And I was like, oh, this is just gonna be a disaster. I'm gonna crash and burn. But I got through it and you can see the relief on my face, I think. And yeah, and it went well. And I finished fifth, you know, I finished fifth and I think that's, quite an achievement for an impressionist really back then as well 
because it's always sort of singers or dance acts and I think spell well spellbound one are you who were the gymnasts. I always do that. Gymnast is that, by the way, I do that. Woo! Who were excellent, by the way. And deservedly one with I mean Twist and Pulse and all this sort of stuff. And and all brilliant. All oh yeah, I think, you know, without trying to sound too biased or the, the particular year was a, a strong year. It was a very strong year. And to finish fifth, I was, I was slightly disappointed not finishing top three. If I'm totally honest, I think I said that on the after show that I was a little bit disappointed. But look, finish fifth on a national TV program that had 14 million viewers, the best showcase you could ever do, you know. And and yeah, it raised the profile a millionfold, you know. And it was like a great opportunity. And uh, luckily, I got I got through it, <laughs> you know fairly unscathed and yeah it was yeah, it was good it was it was good but not good in a way because I it was a lot of pressure do you know what I mean it was quite a lot of pressure on myself but it was it's done, done isn't it you know it's done it you know, certainly did um raise the profile because you were given your own special one hour television <laughs> show called it's Paul Berlin by ITV I just wanted to ask you how that kind of special came about and how do you look back in hindsight at that particular programme? And were you amazed that it was watched by 4 million viewers? That's, again, an incredible achievement. Yeah. Um, well, that particular year, after we finished BGT, we did an arena tour. I mean, it was amazing. You know, we just went Wembley. We did O2 in London and we did Cardiff, every, we went all these massive arenas around the country, you know, to Ireland and everything like that. It was brilliant. It was a wonderful experience. And um, we all bonded brilliantly, all got on really well, all the finalists and stuff like that. So we had a good laugh as well. And yeah. Um, so when it was coming near the end, and I, had, what happened was I didn't have a manager, but they sort of had a company that sort of latched on, nothing really to do with Simon or anybody like that. It was a company that we're in that took the finalists and managed them, if that makes sense. Yeah, I see, yeah. Yeah, they sort of had this company that went, all right, we're managing you now, sort of thing. You signed on the contract, so we are, you know, and that's fine. Anyway, the guy who was managing me, Dan, the lovely guy and stuff like that, and he, I had a couple of days off and I was going to come home. I said, you're not going home, you, you've you got a meeting at um, ITV. Have I? It was literally like that. So stay in, we put you up in a hotel, and uh, you're, you've got a meeting at ITV on the, on the embankment, you know, the big tall building that you see on the telly. Right, OK. Do you know what it's about? No, I ain't got a clue. But we've got a meeting with so-and-so and so-and-so. Right, OK. Got to go with that, you? <laughs> Sorry, love, I'm not coming home. <laughs> why? I've got a meeting at ITV. Oh, really? And, yeah, really, I don't know why. And anyway, so I had this meeting, um, the lady who I did meet, She's, uh, she's not there anymore, but uh, who I met during the process of Britain's Got Talent. She's like a, a commissioner, TV commissioner, commissioner's TV programmes, who named it escaped me, but anyway, I shall not name her if I, if I did. And she's a lovely, lovely lady. And we went, so you, you know, if you're going in, the, if you've ever been at ITV, it's a big tower block. And the higher you go, the higher it is of notoriety, if you like, I think. That's yeah, what I had in my see. head. You know I mean, okay. yeah. If you're on the roof, you're Anton Deck, you know what I mean? <laughs> and we got, I've, I've always remember it's the 26th floor. I might be wrong. I might have dreamt that, but I think it was the 26th floor. So it's quite high. And all these office rooms and stuff like that. And went in with my then manager down and that. And she was lovely. And she said, Oh, it was lovely to meet you. And, you know, how's the tour going? Yeah, it's going great. You know, sort of cup of tea, cake, biscuit, whatever. <laughs> and then she sort of goes, um, well, you know, we, we like, like you, Paul, you know, and that sort of stuff. Oh, that's nice. Um, and she goes, um, we'd like you to do a Christmas special, an hour special for ITP. What? <laughs> I'm thinking, what, me? You got the right person, do you know what I mean? Literally, it was like that, you know. But I still played it a bit cool, you know. Oh, okay. Looked at Dan, Dan to me, it was like, Really? Yeah, we're, we're going to commission you an hour show. So what you need to do is go and find a production company and we'll put it together. And yeah. Right. Now I'm thinking like ITV2 or 
if I'm lucky, IT meet four, you know, or something like that, some random, you know. And it was for ITV One. It was, the, it was sort of like that. I was like, oh my god. So that was a bit crazy because you're just going around meeting, having lots of meetings with production companies, and in the end, ITV made it themselves, you know. And it was yeah, it was, it was hard because one, I've never done that before. Of course, I've never done that. Britain's Got Talent is you doing what you do, you know, that sort of thing. But um, a whole different door opened and it was like, my goodness, I've never experienced that before. And again, it was a lot of pressure because they just, we did some pre-filming in the November or something, because it went out at Christmas. And we did a couple of um, out offset studio uh, shots, you know, some filming and in big houses and stuff like that, as you do, and uh, sketches and stuff. And then they brought in this, uh, Jess uh, Robinson, uh, impressionist, who's wonderful. She's done, but has got talent since. And Eve Webster, who's another great impressionist, and uh, another guy and stuff like that, who are my sort of other people to do impressions with, you know. And uh, yeah, so it's like, it's like literally funny. Then I had to do, we meet all these writers that doesn't, oh, I've never met before. I don't know who they are. They've never met, they don't really know me really. Anybody just said, oh, he was on Britain's Got Talent. Oh, okay. Nice bunch of guys, you know, and, and girls and stuff. And we sort of come up with these ideas. And I come up with loads of ideas. Me and my mates got together saying, bring up my mates, my comedy mates, you know, like at my level at the time. And uh, oh, I've got, got this Christmas special. No way, Paul. Okay. Well, let's, let's write some ideas down, you know. Which we did, we had like, a, you know, quite a thick script. Nothing was ever used of that. <laughs> I don't know if you even looked at it because they had all these writers and I suppose they had to justify that. Didn't have a clue what's going on, you know, it's crazy. And then when we started filming at the studio, I was already rehearsing pantomime. Mm. I was doing both. And I was in Chatham in Kent doing panto, which I did a few times. And it was hard because one mor morning I'll be rehearsing panto then that, in the afternoon, I'll be having going into town, into London, and, and rehearsing for my Christmas special. So it was a bit of a crazy time in my head, you know? And how I reflect on it now is that, you know, whatever anybody thought of it, and, um, you know, it's easy to... Um, I got, you know, with, you know, people... Were, critics are there, because they're critics, aren't they? And TV critics. And remember one that uh, said it was like, you know, not very good and that but then they said that about come fly with me with um matt lucas and david williams you know and eastenders was particularly bad that year as well so i was in good company you know <laughs> so come see come saw um i you know it was hard work i'm not gonna lie i look back at it now and think yeah it could have been a bit different you know um but you can't change it and not many people can say they've had their own special on ITV and got four minutes, like say four minutes, which blew my head away. Yeah, I, I just thought there'd be four yeah. people watching it, let alone four million, and you know, two of them are family. Do you know what I mean? Because when Dan told me the viewing figures, because they showed it twice, didn't they? They showed it sort of the 22nd of December, and they also showed it on New Year's Eve. We ran it, but the first one was when I got four million, well, roughly. 3.7 put to 4 million viewers. And I said, Dan phoned me up, said, my God, you've got viewing figures of 4, point, uh, you know, 4 million. I went, oh, okay, is that good? Mate, that's brilliant. Is it? <laughs> I was going to ask know. you, as, as, a, as a creative, a, a performer, in any capacity, whether you're a comedian or impressionist, it must always be hard to come up with new material. So uh, kind of my next question was, what makes you decide what personalities you're going to impersonate next or, you know, try out in your act or whatever? And I was also going to ask, which, which ones have been your favourites and have you found any particularly difficult to take on? There's always ones you can't do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, With the actual impressions, I tend to do impressions of people or characters that I like. I feel like I've got a, if I actually like that character or that, you know what I mean? Mm. I love like, Alan Hart is so flamboyant, he's been around for ages, you know, and he's a great character and you can get away with saying certain stuff as Alan Hart and I can as me. 
Do you know what I mean? Um, so it tends to be like that. I sort of, um, I do tend to rely probably more on the impression than maybe the material a bit, but because I like to think that people enjoy the impressions, you know, I mean, sometimes a, not such a great gag is made better by being in an impression, if that makes sense, yeah? Or you can get, like I say, with character, certain characters, you can get away with more. The ones I've always loved doing, and it's still to this day, and, uh, you know, I've been doing it act forever, is, is Fools and Horses, you know? Fools and Horses, you know, Boise, bless, uh, John Chalice, bless him. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's 40 years this year, isn't it? It's 40 years the other week. Um, I did a thing for a mate of mine. He's got these puppets of Del Boy. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, Steve Lewis. And he's made these brilliant puppets of Uncle Albert and Del Boy and Rodney and all that sort of stuff. And a friend of a friend got in touch with him saying that I, you know, um, he does the um, Jolly Boys... Uh, uh, what's it called? It's just on a. They do talk about uh, what's the word? Podcast. That's it. And um, I was on that, and I did because I'm a big fan, obviously, and stuff like that. And he got me in touch with Steve, who did these puppets, and he's put together this sort of thing. And I did all the voices for it. You know, it was lovely. You know, and I think even now, you know, Falls and Horses is just it's a phenomenon, really. And I think people just love it and associate. Last night I did a gig last night, and it wasn't very busy because it's on Deer Park and it's sort of that sort of after kids go back to school. But there was still, I could still hear kids laughing, me doing Del Boy and Uncle Albert and that, because I think it's a generation thing. It's one of the ones you sit with your kids and go, you've got to watch this. Yeah, got cl- to- classic television, tremendous yeah. tremendous characters and, and great writing as well. Brilliant writing, yeah, the really. Thing the thing I was going to ask you is you mentioned about new people you've taken on in terms of personalities that you've impersonated, some of your favourites as well. Do you kind of feel that naturally, because you're taking off these voices, that you almost need to make it kind of a comedy act or come up with comedy sketches around those voices? Do you feel that's something you kind of have to do as well? Or yeah, if obviously. So, if if so, on. sorry. Sorry. If so, does that kind of come naturally? Because you mentioned that when you did the, the one-off show, you had all these kind of writers come on board to kind of give it you know, some kind of sense of comedy and some kind of sketch and, you know, make it a bit more performance orientated, I guess. Do you find that hard in some ways? Because I, I guess you're not, you're not a comedian. Is mm. that, is that tricky or how do yeah, you I think, balance the two? Because I do get slightly annoyed when people introduce me as a comedian. Because it's a big difference, you know. Mm. I, I'm a predominantly impressionist who does comedy within those impressions, you know. I've got mates, brilliant mates, who are brilliant comics, you know, excellent comics who can tell gags and gags and gags and gags and, you know, funny as well and, and do it brilliantly, you know. And, um, but I'm not really that, I just do the voices, mate, you know I mean? That's what I do and it's sort of like, but you've got to have some sort of substance to it. Like you said, you've got to have some sort of reason for doing it. And my act to me is like a story because I'm getting a lot older. I'm obviously getting older every minute, but I'm getting older as well. It has to be a story so I can remember it. You know, so it has to be like a sort of flows into some some sort of rhyme or reason for the reason for me to do that impression or that routine. But then you know, sometimes I just even if I'm having a particularly good night or something, I just chuck things in to try them out. You know, I did this uh, and do this um, thing during lockdown and stuff like that. I, I Shame to admit it, but I've got a bit of a driving job because one has to do what one has to do. And sometimes I get the, the rubbish van that didn't have a radio in it. <laughs> so I had to keep myself entertained all day, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I just did voices to myself, as one does, you know. And um, But voices I don't normally do. So I'd be doing... Well, I knew I could do, but ones that I would never... I could do my act, probably, but I've mm-hmm. not really done them. And sometimes you could think, oh, I haven't done that one for a while. It's like we haven't heard a song for a while. I go, oh, yeah, I can, you know, I'm guessing. <laughs> Maybe that's just my mentality. But I'd be sort of reading the side, driving along and reading the side of lorries, you know. And so here comes the red car, overtaken by the blue car. You know, and stuff like that. This is just to myself in the van, you know. People must think I'm a little bit crazy. But and then I started um, doing songs. So I'm a big Queen fan, a massive Queen fan. 
And um, so I'd start doing Queen songs. Uh, love of my life, don't hurt me. You know? <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, but then I moved on to doing um, uh, Morgan Freeman. So I start, which is an impression, impression I've, done, I've, I've done, but one I've never really yet done in the act. So I started going, oh yes, and there goes Tesco's. Every, you know, that sort of thing. But then I started to be doing Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> is this the real life or is this just fantasy? Caught in a landslide <laughs> of escape from reality. Just doing that to myself. And I thought, that's quite funny. Whether other people find that funny is a different thing because, you know, maybe I've got a different warped sense of humour to other people. And that's the thing. The thing about comedy as well, whether it's impressions or stand-up or whatever, or physical comedy or whatever, comedy is such a taste, as we all know, you know. Um, I'm a massive fan of Lee Evans and Billy Connolly and, you know, but there's people out there that actually don't like Billy Connolly and actually don't like uh, Lee Evans or whoever. Do you know what I mean? And comedy is such a taste. And I think, with all due respect to singers, and like I said, they're from different parts of the business, you know, a singer who's a decent singer can go out and sing a song and get away with it if it's like Sweet Caroline or do you know what I mean? Something, a song that everyone loves. Yeah. I'm loving angels instead. You know what I mean? Um, but comedy, you know, it's like, oh. Like, yeah, I know what you're saying. It's very, it's very it's physical. Like, it's, it's, physical. It's, it's like being a movie critic, I guess. It's very subjective and yeah. yeah, some humour, some people like kind of coarse and I suppose blue humour and some people find that insulting and they have issues exactly. with that and they like kind of more maybe clever comedy or maybe um, American style comedy, yeah. like a, a Jim Carrey kind of. Yeah, Robin style. Williams type thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, yeah, you're right, it's very subjective, isn't it? And I think sometimes, you know, after what everyone's been through in the last couple of years and stuff like that, all I want to do is go out and make people smart, the same as everybody else. And, you know, and you never, but then I was always told you'll never please everybody anyway. And we know that, you know, that's, that's the nature of the beast, isn't it? You know, it is. And the business you're in as well. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and you'll never please everybody, you know, for the person, I think the ratio is quite good, you know, for the one person that doesn't like, but you always remember when you're doing a gig, you always remember the person that doesn't like you. All the other people are loving you. You'll see there, you're sat there, and there's always, they're always sat at the front as well. And I like looking at you going, you're rubbish. <laughs> they're not saying it, but you know, they think, they own thinking, you hate me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they probably do. Um, but you forget that all the other people, the other 500 people are loving it. It's that one person. <laughs> it lets it all down for you. Yeah. I, I, yeah. But you from, from stage to performing on one of the biggest television shows on UK TV and all the other work you've done. And then you're in a feature film, you're in the, the Harry Hill movie. And obviously you famously, you know, on Britain's Got Talent and as part of your act, you impersonate Harry Hill as well. Yeah. That must have been um, an interesting experience just to, just to work on kind of a feature film, I guess. Um, what, what was it like, you know? and what was kind of Harry Hill's reaction to, you know, the, the work you've done on him? And what was he like as a, a person? Were you close? Yeah, well, um, again, it all started when I was doing BGT, of course. And um, so the semi-finals when I did the TV burp thing, which I wasn't going to do, but I was sort of, you have a production meeting and it seemed to make sense. And after the the actual semi-final, before the results. So he's standing around, you know, like you do, and having a drink or whatever. So one of the big bosses from ITV come up to me and said, oh, well done, Paul, well done, mate. Um, so by the way, Harry Hill sends his regards. He's in Spain at the moment, on holiday with his family, but he's watching by satellite or whatever. And I was like, oh, okay, that's nice. You know what I mean? Anyway, a couple of days later, of course, the final's looming, and... I had to go to Soho and record the music for 500 Miles for the final. And you can imagine, mate, my phone is off the hook. It's red hot. Everyone's that I've ever met and probably never met are phoning me. Do you know what I mean? And um, so his phone rings and it's a number I've not recognised and stuff like that. I go, oh, hello. And he went, hello, it's Harry Hill. I went, yeah, of course it is. 
but he doesn't actually speak like it's Harry Hill. He just oh, this is Harry Hill. I was like, yeah, of course it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you don't know if it's a mind that you see. It could be the press, you see. And um, yeah, I'm in Spain at the moment. You know, I'm watching you. That's what. Then I went. It is because not many people knew he was in Spain. So I talking to him, I was like, oh my god, what are you doing? What are you, what are you meeting for? So after that, we sort of built up a sort of a friendship, if you like. And I did a couple of things on TV with him. I didn't do TV Burp, which I wanted to do. But I did a thing called Whatever Happened to Harry Hill on Channel 4. And I sort of played him in a reenactment and stuff like that. It was very bizarre, but as you can imagine. And he's always lovely. He's always really nice guy, really friendly, uh, very supportive. And he's like, you know, I'm loving what, you know, lo- love it. You know, you're doing my, my character and... It's working out for you, mate, and all this sort of stuff. Thank you, thank you. And, and then um, couple, it was couple of 2013, you know, I'd message him now and again or whatever. And, um, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good. Busy? Yeah, good. Did a little there. And then 2013, I was out in uh, doing a gig in Egypt, as you do. And um, I got an email from a this guy, Simon, and he said, uh, can you contact me as soon as possible? And the, the um, subject was Harry Hill movie. Right. So I'm in Egypt at the moment. I'll contact you as soon as I get back in the UK, which I did, of course. So that's how I got that, because Harry wanted me to play his dad, <laughs> which is bizarre. I mean, it was just like, it was one of them sort of moments where you go, because then I did the build-up to it, I didn't know much about it. All I knew that I'm in this movie with Harry Hill, the Harry Hill movie. I had to keep it all very quiet, obviously, because that's what they do. All right, then. All I knew that it was me and Harry Hill in it. It could have been just me and him in it. I wouldn't know. So I turned up on the first day of, of uh, filming and um, met Simon in the car park. I went into the... Uh, sounds a bit seedy, not it? We met Simon in the car park, bizarrely, and went in and had a cup of tea. And he goes, right, this is... They got the board of all the pictures of the people that are on it in the film. It says Harry, Matt Lucas, Simon Bird. And this guy, Simon's going, so Matt and Harry are brothers, but um, uh, Matt's his evil twin brother, da 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 uh, Julie Walters, right? She's your mum, my mum, so therefore his grandmother, right? And it's sort of like a whole family tree of people, like, you know, she, um, uh, some Bird, Jim Broadbent is in it. And um, Sheridan Smith, it wasn't acclaimed very well because Harry Hill's different and he's very strange. But to be asked to do that was just, and Leah, my wife said, you do realise that because you've done British, you would never have had that opportunity. So you got something out, it's just another layer on the thing. Okay, it wasn't the most acclaimed film and I was only a very small amount of time. But me and my wife and my kids from my previous marriage um, went to see it in the cinema after I got back from pantomime and I missed out on the um, premiere night because I was doing panto. Anyway, so we, um, show me, isn't it? And then at the end, the credits came up and my name was about Matt Lucas's. <laughs> and my kids and they were like, I think my name in the cinema. But the, one of the bizarre things was Harry's been lovely and I met Matt and Matt was really championing me when I was doing Britain's Got Talent. And we sort of became Twitter friends during BGT. And then when I met him doing the filming, I got really well with him, Love, lovely man. And I met him in lunch break and Harry didn't realise that we'd met. So when we did a bit of filming together, um, Harry goes to Matt, oh, this is Paul Burning, have you met him? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, Harry goes, he does us better than what we do. <laughs> So then me and Matt started doing some of his characters going, yeah, so, no pet, yeah, no pet, yeah, and all that sort of thing. And that was a very bizarre moment, but fun, because we were just doing voices at each other, of his voices, not mine. <laughs> but we all did his voices to him while he was doing his voice as well. So it was really sort of like a wow moment for me. Sadly, didn't video it. My final question before we come on to the final list of questions, and I'm interested to hear... Uh, your thoughts on things you like and don't like. It's always interesting uh, mm. ask it, asking our guests on your take. But my final question was, you've been in the entertainment business now for 25 years. You've done talent competitions, pantomime, you've done voiceover work. 
a feature film that we've just mentioned, you've done radio. Is there a preferred medium that you enjoy working in? And if you had to choose your favorite moment, your ultimate moment from your career, I think I know what you're gonna choose, but which one would you choose? Um, I, I do love doing voiceovers. Um, I've got a mate of mine, he runs a company and they do like, um, he does like, he did Rainbow, that was quite a good example. He gets the rights to Rainbow, gets the puppets, and he takes them to holiday parks and he puts them in pantomimes and all this sort of stuff. So he has the rights to use them. And he always uses me to do the Zippy and George. But then that progressed to doing um, things like, I don't know if you remember Count Duckula. Yeah, I remember Count Duckula. Yeah, it was yeah, David Jason. Yeah, in the early 90s, yeah, it was great. Yeah, brilliant, you know. And um, so I did, um, for those viewers, it, it, they, uh, it was the same people that made uh, Danger Mouse and stuff and um, Cosgrove and Hall. I see, I've got a good memory for them, haven't I? Good God. And um, so I was doing, he said, well, can, you, can you do Count Duckula? I said, yeah, I was a massive fan because it was David Jason as well, wasn't it? And it was like, yeah, Count Duckula, okay then, Nanny. All right, my ducky poos. Because that's a great voice for people in Bristol, isn't it? Because it's a real like, all right, my lover, you know. You know? And uh, Eagle, oh yes, Nanny, and all that sort of stuff. So I did that. And then I did actually did Danger Mouse for him as well. And some other bits and pieces. And I love it because it's just being a bit creative as well. And, he writes a script for each characters and each show, but because he's a mate as well, and we sort of bounce off each other. I said, well, we'll kind of put that in that one there, put that so, well, That's a good game, but then maybe if you put, you know, I mean, it's, it's been really creative. So I really like doing that. Um, I'm not very good at voiceovers, I'll be honest, as me. Do you know what I mean? I'm rubbish at me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, whatever. But in, put it, give it a character, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And, there's a time for love and honour. That's all fun. And I love that. Um, so I really do enjoy voiceover and I do a fair bit. I like to do more. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think, I suppose the real highlight really was um, was that moment, I think, that standing ovation, which still gets me now, you know, to, to, in Cardiff, um, where I used to live as well. And um, the fact that, you know, you can't, you can't, plan that can you? you can't just I don't again I don't people think I'll be potentially it's just because it was that sort of realization that actually after all those years that that notoriety really I think it was that sort of like wow moment for me not for them it might have been a wow moment for them but it was a wow moment for me to realize that you know I'm not that bad <laughs> I don't know self-deprivation I know but it's it's very much a confidence game, like anything, really, in any walk of life, any job, you know? And it's a lot of it is about confidence. And I think some entertainers like myself, I, I, sometimes we lack that, you know, because sometimes you might not, it's like anybody in any job, you have a good day at the office, sometimes you have a bad day at the office, you know? You know, my wife has a bad day at work, sometimes she has a good day at work. We all have bad days, you know? And um, the trouble is when it's my bad day, I've had a bad gig, you know? <laughs> And I still take it a little bit personally, but at the same time, you can't, because you can do your act one night and smash it, you know, like I said before, you can have a cracking gig. Everybody seems to love you, apart from that one bloke that sits the front, but ignore him, you know. Uh, <laughs> but then do the same act, exactly the same act, the next night, and struggle. What's changed? It's the audience that have changed. You know, you try and adapt accordingly to your audience, of course you do. But you can only do so much. So sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I like to think most of the time I win. Do you know what I mean? And it comes down to the whole business, you know, and and that's what we keep doing it. You know, we keep doing it because we love it. You know, I love what I do. I love, I love, like I say, putting smiles on people's faces, hopefully. And if they don't, then I'm not, I'm not hurting anyone. Am I? I'm not really, I'm not trying, I'm not killing anybody, am I? You know, I'm just trying to, Put a smile on your face, and if you don't like it, then that's fine. But you have to move on and go over it. <laughs> and ultimately, try trying to entertain and make people's yes, yeah, yeah, put smile on faces, and, and yeah, people enjoy it. Yeah, I like to think so. You know, like I said, you, you can't always, as we said before, you can't always win, James. And it's just a shame, really, because you know I'm not offensive. Or you're talking about earlier about different styles of um, stand up. You know, being blue or being um, 
aggressive or you know there's different styles and they all have their place of course they do um that's i've tried to change my style sometimes but it's just not me i just heart and sleeve and that's what i do and that's i can't you know i do i have done comedy clubs and stuff before and i love them because you've got a bit more freedom and i'll uh, still do the impressions but i do them in a different slightly different style or maybe a more adult style or because you're working to an adults only audience and, as opposed to a family audience which is fine but nothing too i wouldn't i don't ever really swear like for the sake of it i might swear because billy connolly is quite well known for swearing as we all know so when i'm doing billy connolly if i'm doing billy connolly in my family show i won't swear but if i'm doing it in a comedy club you're going to swear because that's what i expect because that's what he does do you know what i mean that's interesting isn't it? this happy. is this is the moment I always uh, enjoy. I'm always interested to see what people say with the answers. We've had some interesting ones. These are just quick fire questions just to, to wrap up the interview. So, Paul Berlin, here we go. So, first of all, what is your favourite pastime? Uh, I'm a big football fan. I support Liverpool and they're brilliant. And we've just got a puppy so that I have no time at all. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favourite film and why? Uh, my favourite film, I have different genres, but I shall go comedy because it's we're talking about comedy. Life of Brian because it's brilliant. Next one, we move from cinema to um, novels. Who's your favourite novelist? I don't really read novels, but I tend to read autobiographies, as in uh, Lee Evans, um, David Jason, and uh, Robbie Fowler from yeah, Liverpool player as well tremendous player oh, he was a gold, gold, gold machine in the Premier yeah. League back yeah. in the 90s um, if you could have had a different profession what would it have been if you could have done anything else if I was any good at it which I'm not I would have wanted to have been a footballer but I'm rubbish so I'm quite good at art so I think I would have carried on doing art arty things drawings and stuff like that but I don't do it anymore if I was Quick fact for you, um, not many people know this. When I was a kid at primary school, I won a national competition for a painting and it toured the whole of the UK. We oh, went right. to see it in London. Ah. Frost yeah. on a tree, it was called. Never got it back. If anybody knows, please come out back. It could, could be worth <laughs> millions now, in fairness. Oh, mate, yeah. it's going to be worth a yeah. bomb, you know yeah. what I mean? A burning original. And then the following year, I came second in the whole of the country as well. Who in life would you say has been your greatest inspiration? Well, generally, um, greatest inspiration. I don't know. Uh, Kenny Dalglish. <laughs> what a player. What a manager as well. Yeah, I think he was just amazing. He's just, to go through what he did at Hillsborough and all that sort of stuff. No. There's not many people that I um, get show busy about, like I wouldn't get nervous about meeting. I've only had one experience, and that was Brian May, when I met Brian May, because I was doing pantomime with his wife, with Anita, who's gorgeous, and I turned into a gibbering wreck, meeting Brian May. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I imagine, <laughs> and he was lovely as well. So cool, such a lovely man. And also, um, I think I'd be like that if I ever met Kenny. I'd be like that. <laughs> so that'd be that. Do you read a newspaper? And if so, which one? I, not a physical paper anymore. Um, I, being a Liverpool fan, I don't read the that one. Um, yeah, I can understand no. why. Yeah, and um, but I read the, the Mirror, which is it's only on the phone. I don't. You know, I only read because when I was, used to get a paper, I only used to read the back but for the football. Doing that, just doing that. So that's me on the paper. That's the newspaper, kids. And um, so I didn't read it from the back. And then when I started doing the entertainment business, so you start reading for little stories that maybe I could use for celebrities or something like that. You know what I mean? Or something topical or tropical, whatever. Anyway, yeah, so I just read, yeah, it's a mirror. But oh, from a tabloid now to food, what's your favourite food? Oh, I love food. Lockdown wasn't good. Um, I do like, I love, like I said before, James, I do love cooking. I really enjoy cooking. Um, I'm not a brilliant, but I, I my, 
if I'm really pushed, I think steak, a good, a lovely steak. I know people go, oh, it's a bit boring, but steak and some nice chips and onion rings and all that, and tomato, baked tomato, and garlic mushrooms and stuff. Oh. This is always a tricky one. Who would Thanks. you say is your favourite cultural icon? Cultural icon? Um, David Attenborough, isn't it? It's got to be. He's uh, so he, brilliant, isn't he? He's he, so brilliant. Very good indeed, yeah. You know, he seems a lovely man as well. As the animals crawl from underneath the shells. You know, another one you'd sort of mean go, I never David Attenborough. Do you know what I mean? Because he's so, he knows, he's, he's, you know, he's not just, he's just brilliant. Everything he does, his voice is wonderful. He expresses things so well on every, he's spot on every time, isn't he? He's spot on every time. And you can say this, you're allowed to, even though we're not past the watershed, but who cares? Um, what's your favourite curse word and why? As the great Billy Connolly says, you can't beat the word fuck, can you? <laughs> it's that routine with the um, <laughs> 1982, I think it was. So I was 13. And um, my dad doesn't like swearing, doesn't like me swearing. Stuff. He's not, we're not, uh, you know, prude or anything at all. But I, even now, if I say bloody on the phone to my dad, I'm sorry, dad. You know, do you know what I mean? But um, we watched an audience with Billy Connolly, which is, one, if you've never seen it, it's the funniest, even now, from 1982, it is funny, 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 funny. And it, it was like, it goes on about, I'm sort of known for using profound language. <laughs> so, you know, isn't the word fuck great? Because you can just see it, can you? And it gets home, you know, that sort of stuff. And, you know, you can't say fuck off, he hinted. Because it's there, it's just, yeah. It's, I mean, you know, I don't tend to use words like that, of course, Jane. But, um, uh, um, but yeah, it's a great it's, it's a great word because you know where you stand with that, don't you? That's There's no way around that, it. That, that impression was tremendous. Um, what would you say is your favourite place or holiday destination? Oh, mate. Well... Europe, it's Portugal. Uh, further afield, me and my wife went to Mexico for our honeymoon, which was amazing. But uh, a few years ago, we went to Dubai, and that was out of this world. It was just great. Yeah, I love Dubai. Yeah. So Endless good. Place. We went, yeah. we were staying outside Dubai, because as you probably know, being there, they don't do all inclusives, do they? Do you know what I mean? But if you go to a bit further out, this one, which is um, Hilton by Double Tree by Hilton one, and it's all inclusive. It was phenomenal. I know what people go, oh, all inclusive, you know what I mean? But it weren't like that. It was just a beautiful place. The food was to die for, and lots of alcohol. But then we went in on a day trip into Dubai, did the old um, Bird of Khalif and all that, you know, all that sort of stuff, and it was just incredible. And the, and the fountains, and very, very hot. And we've been, we got a pizza and we got, where were they? We got a pizza and we found a bar that did, a restaurant that did alcohol as well. And we had a couple of glasses of Prosecco and a pizza and it cost £100. The best pizza. It's only just about that. It's like that. <laughs> the most expensive pizza in the world. You've mentioned, you you've mentioned music a couple of times in the interview yeah. and, a, and a love of Queen. Um, yeah. Who would you say is your favourite all-time music artist and your favourite album? Right. My favourite is Queen. It's got to be Queen. You know, and it'd be like slightly boring, but it's not because they, the, the variety of their music and the um, they were just phenomenal. And my biggest regret is not seeing them live with Freddie. You know? I know I had the opportunity and I didn't take it for some reason. But yes, because um, my grandparents lived in Nebworth little village just outside of Hertfordshire and of course they've got Nebworth where Queen performed at the um not at my nan's garden or anything like that but it was like you know at the actual Nebworth house and uh my nan would complain about the noise um seriously <laughs> bless her 
But yes, Queen all day long, like, you know, especially when you're driving late at night. And I know a few of my mates do this as well. If you listen to Queen, you drive faster. Please don't stop me now. Honest officer, I was listening to Queen. <laughs> so officer, I'm listening to Queen. It's making me drive faster. Oh. Um, Queen and my favourite, best album. Wow. Okay. I think it was the one that introduced me to Queen. And that was the night of the opera. Yeah. And because it was a bit weird as well. A bit surreal, and just something different that I was listening. To. So, you know, so but then saying that, um, I got quite a, a, a mixture of, of um, things. Because people say, "Oh, what's your first album you brought?" Well, my first DVD, no, sorry, CD, something CD. Uh, I bought two at the same time. My first CDs were like uh, was completely different from Queen. Was Level Forty Two World Machine. Yeah, I do. I'm trying to think of the guy, the bassist. He was very yeah, Mark weird. King. Mark King, yeah, incredible bass player. <laughs> yeah, we've seen him live at Colston Hall. Well, it's not Colston Hall, but you know, I've seen him live. Brilliant, absolutely amazing. And Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits was my first two sort of CDs I brought at the same time. Yeah, it's a big fan of music generally, obviously, because you know, because you're in the car a lot, so you listen to a lot of music. And but yeah, Queen is the one for me, really. And um, I'm a bit annoyed because my wife has actually been to a concert of Queen. Um, she's a bit younger than me, my latest wife, I hasten to add. And um, she actually went to a Queen concert in Milton Keynes, where she's from. And But she was in her mum's belly at the time. But still she went, didn't she? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? She still, heard, the, she still heard the music. <laughs> um, <laughs> The final two questions. The first right. one, what's your greatest achievement to date? Apart from the kids, um, career-wise, obviously, was that with um, BGT. And the Christmas special was the, the icing on the cake, I think. The cherry on top. And then finally, Paul Berlin, we're going to get very deep here. How do you wish to be remembered? Uh, I like to think people liked me and that he did some quite good impressions. <laughs> yeah, just sort of like, you know, good bloke. Um, I, I am quite, I, I do wear my heart on my sleeve probably a bit too much. Um, uh, yeah, I think, oh God, it's a hard thing to answer really. Because not what I would think. Maybe they probably think he's a dick. <laughs> no, I mean, he's a prick. Um, probably. Um, but yeah, good bloke. Um, good to be... Cares a lot about people that cares about him, which is true. And uh, quite good at voices. I think that's a lovely way to end. Thank you kindly for, A, for giving up your time. Thanks for making it a very fun and enjoyable interview. I've really loved the impressions. I've really enjoyed just listening to your story. And it's nice to talk as well to someone local, being a, yeah. a fellow Bristolian. I've spoken to a few Bristol personalities with your take. And, but finally, how do people get to see yourself, get to see your show? And how do they find out more information on your work? Well, they go to my website, as you know, um, paulburning.com. I've got a Facebook page as well, Paul Burning Comedy Impressionist. And yeah, so I tend to put stuff on them that so people know what I'm up to. Because I'm doing pantomime this year. Nice and local to Bristol, actually. Rotherham. <laughs> so is that bloody Andy Ford, isn't it? Andy Ford, whatever. He's doing pantomime, yeah. So he's a mate. And we do, I was saying to you about earlier that we do shows, me and Andy Ford do shows together, and it's great because he's such a lovely guy, as you well know. Funny boy, funny boy, funny man. Um, we've known each other for years and years. We were talking about it the other night when we did a gig together. It's his show, but I'd still tag along and get up. And uh, he asked me to join him, which is great. You know, it's good because we've got contrasting styles. And he doesn't really do impressions, but I do impressions of him on stage. I think I said the other night, <laughs> really bizarre. You know, I said, uh, I did an impression because all the people there to see him really, you know, I'm a few people have been there to see me. And so I did sort of basically the, the warm-up act, if you like. And I go, I said, um, 
So I did my impression of Andy on stage. I write my lovers, and he's like, he's like that, and I, I write my dears. Oh my god! And um, I said, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, working with uh, Andy, mate, he rubs off on you. And then when he started laughing, so I thought, oh, I can't say that anymore. <laughs> but yeah, so that's good fun. And yeah, I like doing stuff in Bristol. I don't do enough really. Maybe um, I should put a little tour together or something like that. Well, now things are getting sort of back to some sort of normality. Whether people would come and see me or not, I don't know. I wish you all, all the very best with pantomime season and all the projects, the, the live the, the live shows and so on yeah, for the future. And thanks a lot once again. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Lovely to meet you, James. And um, thank you so much for inviting me along. Really appreciate it, mate.